ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له نشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد continuing with our look at some contemporary maslas or issues with regards to salah and in particular those maslas or those issues where there are differences of opinion where there are differences of opinion amongst the ulama amongst the scholars and amongst the various schools of thought amongst the various mazahib and due to the differences of opinion due to the different saying many people are confused many people do not know what is the correct opinion with regards to this particular masla or this particular issue many people don't know that what does imam abu hanifa rahmatullah alayhi say with regards to this particular masla and issue and because of all these different opinions they hear while they go on tv on the internet or from their friends at universities and college a lot of people they get confused so the idea like last week's dars and even in this week's dars and probably the week after will be concentrating on those kind of topics those kind of contemporary issues where people they like to know what does the imam hanifa rahmatullah alayhi say with regards to this particular masla and what is the correct opinion with regards to this particular masla in last week's dars in last week's lesson i mentioned the issue with regards to rakul yaday and i said that it is a consensus of all the ulama all the scholars that to raise your hand when you start your salah wa takbir tahrima to raise your hand when you start your salah then it is sunnah to raise your hand however the issue or the topic or the masla is that when a person goes into ruku when he says allahu akbar and he goes into ruku and then when he says sami allahu liman hamida and he comes up from the ruku then should he raise his hands or not and i mentioned that imam shafi rahmatullah alayhi imam ahmad bin hanbal rahmatullah alayhi of the view that a person should raise his hand it is more virtuous more preferable to raise your hand was going for ruku and similarly was coming up from the ruku whereas imam abu hanifa rahmatullah alayhi and imam malik rahmatullah alayhi of the view that it is preferable not to do rakul yadain it is preferable to omit rakul yadain when going for ruku and when coming up from the ruku then evidences hadiths supporting the view of imam shafi rahmatullah alayhi supporting the view of imam abu hanifa rahmatullah alayhi was looked at in quite detail last week and i mentioned at the end that this difference of opinion is based upon which of the two is more virtuous to do imam hanifa rahmatullah alayhi imam malik of the view that it is more virtuous not to do rakul yadain however if a hanafi or if a maliki say if he was to do rakul yadain if he was to raise his hands whilst going for ruku and whilst coming up from ruku then his salah his namaz would not be considered invalid it would not be considered disliked or detestable in any way whatsoever and this is the view of imam shafi rahmatullah alayhi that even though they say that it's more virtuous to do rakul yadain however if a person doesn't do rakul yadain and he goes into ruku he comes up from the ruku without doing rakul yadain again it would not affect his namaz it would not affect his salah in any way whatsoever so that was one issue which we looked at last week we also looked at the issue of where should a person place his hand like when he after he does the tasbih the tahlima should he place his hand below his navel should he place his hand above the navel again the jurisprudence or the fiqh side of it was looked at what does imam hanif rahmatullah alayhi say what does imam shafi rahmatullah alayhi say and then the evidence supporting both of the views were looked at in quite detail now in today's lesson inshallah we're going to be concentrating on two particular masla the first masla or the first issue which we are going to look at is with regards to the moving of the index finger at the time of tashahhud and the second masla will be with regards to women's salah that when a woman when she reads her salah when she reads the namaz then are there any differences between the way a woman reads the namaz 
and the way a man reads the namaz, or is it exactly the same? That the same way a man reads his namaz as he goes into ruku, or when he goes into sajda, he spreads his limbs and his legs out and so on. Then similarly, when a woman, when she reads the namaz, should she spread her legs out, should she spread her limbs out, and so on. So these are the two topics, inshallah, which we will try to cover uh, this week. And then after that, there will be a question-answer session. So any brothers who have any questions, then they could forward it to me. Now, the first issue is with regards to the moving of the index finger at the shakla. Now, it should be understood that the raising of the index finger in tashahud, what do you mean by tashahud means at tahiyat that in at tahiyat is sunnah. It is an act of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions and their predecessors and their predecessors to raise the index finger at the time of tashahud and all the ulamas and all the scholars agree. And this is based upon a hadith which can be found in Sahih and Muslim narrated by Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu that he says or he describes the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would read his salah and he says that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sat for tashahud that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would sit for at-tahiyyat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would place his left hand on his left knee then he would place his right hand on his right knee and then he will begin the tashahud, he will begin at-tahiyyat and then when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa approached the phrase Ashhadu wa la ilaha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would make a ring-like shape with his thumb and his middle finger so he'll make a, like a ring shape like this and then he will raise his index finger at the time of Ashhadu wa la ilaha and that is a hadith which can be found in Sahih al-Muslim narrated by Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu so that is the first masla with regards to that it is sunnah to raise your finger at the time of tashahud, at the time of tayyah. Now the topic for discussion is when you raise your index finger, should you keep your index finger still? Should you just keep it as it is? Or should you move your index finger around? Now when you, for example, when you said ashadu wa la ilaha, so you raise the index finger. Should, should you keep your index finger still and pointed all the way until the namaz and the salah finishes or should you move it around as some people do? Now firstly, Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi, Imam Shafi rahmatullahi, and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rahmatullahi, after view that the finger, the index finger should not be moved continuously all the way until the salah finishes. Basically, like the index finger should be kept still, should be kept pointed, and it should remain in that state all the way until the namaz finishes. Whereas Imam Malik Rahmatullah is of the view that the index finger should move around, or that you should move around your index finger from when you raise it all the way until you finish your salah. So when you say, Ashadu Allah ilaha, so those who follow the mazhab of Imam Malik Rahmatullahi it is preferable for them that to raise their or to move their index finger all the way until their namaz and their salah finishes. Now according to Imam Hanifa Rahmatullahi this difference between himself and Imam Malik is based upon which of the two is more virtuous to do. Imam Hanifa Rahmatullahi says that it is more virtuous not to move your index finger until all the way until your namaz and your salah finishes. Whereas Imam Malik Rahmatullah says that it is preferable to move your index finger. With regards to Imam Shafi Rahmatullah and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Rahmatullah they are quite strict on this particular masala. And Imam Nawawi Rahmatullah a famous Shafi scholar who's written a commentary of Sahih al-Muslim has written that it is considered makruh and dislike to move your index finger from the moment you raise it all the way until you finish your namaz. So according to the Shafi Mazhab, when you raise your index finger for Ashadu Allah Ilaha, to keep on moving it all the way until you finish your namaz is actually considered dislike and makruh. And similar things can be found in the Hanbali Mazhab as well. Whereas according to Mahanifa Rahmatullah, he just says that 
if a person was to move it around during tashahud, during at tahiyat all the way until the end, his namaz will not be considered invalid, he will not be considered detestable or disliked. However, it's preferable for him not to do that. Now, the view of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi, Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad, is supported or is consolidated from a hadith which can be found in Sunan in the And the hadith which is narrated by Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Zubair anhu, that he again described the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is to read his salah. And he says that I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sitting in tashahud and then whilst approaching the phrase Ashadu wa la ilaha he would point with his index finger. He would point with his index finger and wala yuharrikuha and he would not move it. The hadith of Sunan Nasai where he's saying that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the tashahud, when he used to read the tashahud and when he approached the phrase Ashadu wa la ilaha so he would raise his index finger. However, he would not move it, la yuharrikuha, he would not move it all the way until the salah and all the way until the namaz finishes. So that is the hadith, clear hadith saying la yuharrikuha, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not move his index finger and this is the view of, or this hadith supports the view of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad. Whereas those who say that it is preferable to move your index finger, they use the hadith narrated by Sayyiduna Wa'il bin Hujar anhu, and this hadith can be found in Sunan al-Nasai where he says, where he again narrates that he saw the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa read the tashahud and he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa pointing with his index finger and then he says, I saw him moving it. You have Riku Hai, got the word that I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa moving, moving his index finger. So that hadith of Sunan al-Nasai supports uh, the view of Imam Malik Rahmatullahi and those uh, scholars who say that it is preferable to move your index finger. Now as I've said that this difference is based upon which of the two is more virtuous to do. Now the Hanafi scholars they said that it is more preferable not to move your index finger in the mark. And why is it more preferable not to move your index finger it is because of the reasons which I mentioned last week under the section of Rafi Ladeh. Now, I mentioned two main reasons why the Hanafi jurisprudence say that Rafi Ladeh should be omitted. Similarly, those two reasons are cited to support why uh, the moving of the index finger should not be done in Namar. Now, what are those two reasons? The first reason is that not moving your index finger is more in line with the verse of the Holy Quran. And the verse is وَقُوبُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِي Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you stand in prayer and in worship in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then stand qaniti, i.e. stand is devotion stand like where you read namaz in such a way where you are concentrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you shouldn't be thinking about any worldly things you shouldn't be thinking about football you shouldn't be thinking about food or anything like that but you should just be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from this particular verse, the scholars have said that those namaz, those salah, where there is less action, less movement, then that enables a person to achieve tranquility and kunut and devotion in his heart. Because obviously if you are reading namaz and you're playing around with a beard, you're playing around for clothes and so on, then that namaz is far less likely to achieve that tranquility, that peace and devotion as stated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran and that is ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran that when you read your namaz then read with punut, read with devotion, read with concentration. So obviously we can deduce from this particular point that in tashahud to constantly move your index finger around then you are increasing the number of actions, you are increasing the number of movements in your salah so therefore that goes against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Holy Quran that when you read, read with devotion, read with concentration, read with tranquility. So that is one reason why the Hanafi jurisprudence have said that it is preferable not to, rate, uh, not to move the index finger. And the second point, which I also mentioned last week as well, is that when we 
analyze the history of Namaz, we see that at the very beginning of Islam, when Namaz became prescribed, there were many movements, and many movements were allowed in Namaz. I mentioned last week that at the very beginning of Islam, people they would read Namaz, the Sahaba they would read Namaz, and they were allowed to talk to the Sahaba next to them. They were allowed to talk to the person next to them in Namaz. Namaz was going on, but they were allowed to talk to the person next to them. They were allowed to look around. If somebody gave salam, they were allowed to reply to the salam. In Namaz, if someone like was to play around with his clothes or anything, no, nothing happened. You know, the, the Namaz would not be considered invalid, would not be considered even disliked. But these things slowly, slowly was abrogated by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That at the very beginning of Islam, it was permissible to talk in Namaz. However, that ruling was abrogated, and now you have Namaz as it is now. So when we analyze the history of namaz, we can establish a root or a principle. And that is that namaz was a thing that at the very beginning there were many, many movements. But then slowly these movements were abrogated, these movements were re- removed. And we have namaz as it is now with far less movement as it was at the very beginning of Islam. So the Hanafi scholars have said that it could be so that at the very beginning of Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's practice or his sunnah or he may have permitted the moving of the index finger for tashahud then, then slowly slowly these things were abrogated or these things were removed and then we have namaz as it is now that it should be done calmly it should be done with peace it should be done with tranquility it should be done with devotion and concentration so these are a few uh, points which I mentioned with regards to the Hanafi scholars that why you should not move your index finger all the way until the namaz finishes. One final masla here, again a lot of people ask, and that is that when you raise your index finger for tashahud, you say, Ashadu wa la ilaha, then at illallah, should you drop your index finger or shall you, or should you keep your index finger raised all the way until the namaz finishes? Now the jurists, or the, you could say the Hanafi jurists, now there's one thing, uh, they are called jurists, and the other ones are muhaddisi. Jurists are those who concentrate more on the fiqhi side of uh, the mazhab, the fiqhi side like the maslas and the rulings and so on. So the Hanafi jurists, they have said that it is preferable or it is sunnah to raise your index finger at la ilaha. That when you say Ashadu wa la ilaha, then you should raise your index finger and that and at illallah you should drop your index finger. And this rule can be found in all the Hanafi jurisprudence books like Imam Haskafi Rahmatullah Zurre Muhtar in Radul Muhtar, even if you open Salimul Haq Beshti Zewar, they will take the same ruling and that is that La ilaha, you should raise your index finger and at illallah you should drop your index finger. However, the muhaddisi, i.e. the Hanafi muhaddisi, they have said that it is preferable to keep your index finger pointed all the way until the namaz finishes. That basically, at Ashadu wa la ilaha, you should raise your index finger, then at illallah, you shouldn't drop it. You should keep it still and pointed all the way until you finish your tashahud, all the way until you read Durud Ibrahim and the dua afterwards. And this is a view of Mullah Liqai Rahmatullahi has written this in his Mirqat. And two uh, very prominent Dawbandi scholars, Monana Yusuf bin Nuri Rahmatullahi in his Ma'rif Sunan and Monana Rashid Ahmad Gongoi Rahmatullahi in his Kawqab al which is a commentary of Sunan al has stated the same principle and that is that when you raise your index finger for Tashakhud at the time of Ashadu Allah Ilaha, you should keep it raised all the way until the namaz finishes. You shouldn't drop it at the time of illallah. And the reason why is because the things which we read after at tayyah like Durud Ibrahim and the Dua, they are supplication. And I'm going to mention this later, that to raise your hands for Dua and supplication is a sunnah of Rasulullah Many hadiths where Rasulullah would raise his hand was doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now because the content which we read after a sayyah is dua and because we cannot raise our hands for dua in namaz because if we were like reading tashahud and if we were to raise our hands then because amal al has been found because of excessive or action has been found our namaz will become invalid. So therefore Mawlana Rashid Ahmad Gungoy Rahmatullahi has written that it is preferable that you keep your index finger raised and the raising of the index finger is in substitute or is qai muqam of raising your hands in namaz and there are also other hadiths as well supporting this view that sometimes where Rasulullah couldn't raise his hands for dua Rasulullah would raise his index finger and that index finger would be equivalent or would be like substitute for raising your hands in uh, namaz so therefore the view of Mona Rashid Amgongwe Rahmatullahi and similarly of Mona Yusuf bin Nuri Rahmatullahi is that the index finger should be raised at the time of the shahud and it should be kept raised, it should be kept pointed all the way until the namaz finishes. So Alhamdulillah that concludes the first topic. The second topic which we're going to look at for the remainder of today's lesson is with regards to the women's namaz. That when a woman, when she reads her namaz, does she read it exactly the same as a man? Or are there any subtle differences between the way a man reads his namaz and the way a woman reads her namaz? Now before I dwell into this particular issue, just have to mention one principle or one thing, which is very obvious, but it needs to be mentioned. And that is that there is a difference between a man and a woman. A person who has a sane mind, a person who has any intellect, he would not say that a man and a woman, they are the same. There is a difference between man or men and women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them in pairs. Why? Because there is a difference between men and women. The way a man talks, he talks more in you know, like a very deep voice, is different than where the way a woman talks. That when she talks, she talks in a sweet voice, she talks in a kind of like a, a very soft voice, soft tone. And because of that reason, many scholars have said that if there is a danger that if, if a woman talks, it may create some kind of, or it may entice some kind of unlawful desire in a man's heart then it is impermissible, it is unlawful for that woman to talk in that sweet, soft tone. Similarly, the way a man walks is different from the way a woman walks. A man who tends to walk in a robust way, whereas a woman, she tends to walk in a very slow way, moving her body around. The way the, the, way the man thinks is different from the way a woman thinks. That a man, he doesn't tend to get emotional quickly whereas a woman she tends to get emotional very quickly and that is illustrated in a hadith where the Prophet of Allah وسلم, himself has described women as nafisa to akli so there is a difference there is a distinction between men and women and this distinction is also illustrated in various masail and in various jurisprudence rules take for example the sutter or the covering of the body as I mentioned this before that for a man the portion or the part of the body which he has to cover is from his belly button up to and including his knees whereas for a woman she has to cover her whole body according to the Hanafi mother of her whole body besides her face her hands and her feet similarly other jurisprudence rulings like for example it is obligatory for men to attend the Jummah Namaz, for men to attend the Eid Namaz, whereas it is not obligatory for women to come for the Jummah Namaz, for women to come for the Eid Namaz. And this is illustrated in a hadith which can be found in uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, narrated by Tariq bin Shihab anhu, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that Jummah is obligatory for every Muslim, except four. And those four are a slave, a woman, a child, and someone who's sick, someone who's insane, someone who's sick, then besides them for Jummah is not obligatory. So from this we can understand that in terms of the ruling there is a difference. That Jummah is obligatory for men, 
However, for a woman, it's not obligatory. However, it should be said that if a woman does come to the mosque and she does read Jummah namaz, like some masajid, they give permission for women to come to the mosque and read the Jummah namaz. And if she reads the nam- Jummah namaz, then the Jummah namaz would be accepted. She doesn't have to read Zuhur namaz afterwards. But just in terms of obligation, Jummah is not obligatory for women. However, it is obligatory for men. Similarly, another distinction between men and women is in terms of the imamah, leading the prayer. As you know, men, they are allowed to lead the prayers, they are allowed to give azan, they are allowed to give iqama, whereas a woman, she's not allowed to lead the prayer. She's not allowed to give the azan, she's not allowed to give the iqama. So there's a distinction between men and women. Even in terms of like jewelry and adornment, as I mentioned before, that women are allowed to wear silk, women are allowed to wear gold. However, Men are not allowed to wear gold. Men are not allowed to wear silk. It is haram for men to wear silk. It is haram for men to wear gold. And the greatest distinction between men and women can be seen in the rules of divorce. That in divorce, when it comes to divorce issues, Islam or the Sharia did not give the responsibility of issuing the divorce on the shoulders of women. That women are not allowed to divorce their husbands. If an argument happens, say, between the husband and the wife, and just say, for example, if the woman was allowed to divorce her husband, then because a woman, she tends to get emotional quickly, she tends to, like, you know, uh, for example, like, say things which she shouldn't say, then what will happen is that she will straight away say divorce to her husband and the, divorce, and the marriage will be severed or will be broken straight away. However, what does Islam say? Islam says that, no, the issuing of divorce is on the shoulders of the man, or is on the shoulders of the husband. That even if there is an argument, then the husband straight away would not say the words of divorce. Instead, he will think about the consequences, he will think about the situation, and then if he's like basically had enough, then he may like divorce his wife. So there is a distinction. One, the reason I'm giving you these different messiahs is to tell everyone, to show to everyone that there is a distinction between men and women. That just the way, the same way, there are physical distinctions between men and women. Similarly, there is also a distinction between men and women when it comes to rulings and when it comes to Muslim. Now, similarly, this, this, this distinction is found in the way the woman reads her namaz. Now, when a woman, when she reads her namaz, she should read it in a way distinct from the way a man reads his namaz. Basically, a woman, she should not read her namaz the same way or exactly the same way as a man reads his namaz. The same way with regards to rulings of divorce and marriage and purification and, nam- and other things, there is a distinction. Similarly, when, the, when, the, when, a Muslim, when a Muslim woman comes to perform her namaz, when she comes to do the various positions and postures in namaz, then there is a distinction between the way she reads her namaz and the way a man reads his namaz. And it should be understood that this distinction is not something which Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi has just mentioned himself. This, in fact, is a teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is where many people get confused and they think that, oh, this is something which the Hanafi Muslim just kind of invented later on. No, that is not true. This is actually a teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a teaching of the companions the Sahabas and the teachings of the Tabi'in and the Sabi Tabi'in that there is a distinction in the way a woman reads her namaz and, a, and in the way the way the man reads his namaz. There is a distinction, there is a difference between uh, their respective namaz. Now I'll just give you some examples or just some hadiths to illustrate the distinction between the way a man reads his namaz and the way a woman reads her namaz. Now, Imam Bayhaqi rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, famous muhaddith, has written in his sunan that the principle which determines or the principle which is the main reason why the woman will read her namaz differently from a man is based on concealment. Now, what does that mean? It means that that position or that posture which is more concealing for the woman is more better than that position or that posture which is not concealing for the woman. So I'll just give you an example. 
Like as we know that when a man, when he goes for sajda, then it is sunnah that he spreads his limbs, he spreads his hands and so on and so forth. Now just imagine if a woman was to read her namaz like that. Now if a woman was to read her namaz and she's spreading her arms, she's spreading her legs and so on, and somebody was walking past the room and just like peeped into the room, obviously that, that person shouldn't be peeping into somebody else's room, but let's say if he does and he sees a woman in that kind of posture, in that kind of position where her legs and everything are spread and so on, then what will happen is that that man will be able or will see you know, some intimate part of the woman. Not like you know, really explicit intimate part of the woman, but you know, he could see the backside of the woman, he could see the, you know, the limbs of the woman and so on and so forth. So that's why the scholars have said that that position when she does a sajda, which is more concealing for her, which covers her body, is more preferable than that position where is not or where it is not concealing for her. So that's why the Hanafi scholars have said that when a woman, when she does sajda, she shouldn't do sajda with her hands and her legs spread out, but instead she should be in an encrouched position. Her body should, uh, her arm should be close to her body, her legs should be tight, her, her buttocks should be on the floor, and then in that state, in that posture, in that position, she should perform the sajda. So that is the main reason why there is a difference between the way a man reads his namaz and a woman reads his namaz is because on the principle of concealment. That that position, that posture which is more concealing for the woman is more better than that position which is not concealing for her. Now I'll just mention some hadiths to illustrate that this is a teaching of Rasulullah and the distinction between the way a man reads his namaz and a woman reads his namaz, her namaz was something which was laid down by Rasulullah The hadith which can be found in Tabrani where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he sees Sayyiduna Wa'il bin Hujar radil anhu a sahabi reading his namaz so the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him that Ya ibn Hajar the O son of Hujar when you pray make your hands level with your ears that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying to him that when you pray or when you start your namaz then make your hands in line or level with your ear and tell your women folk or you tell the women of your family that when they pray they should raise their hands in line with their chest and in line with their breath so this is a hadith quite clearly Rasulullah telling the sahabi that there is a difference between the way a man would raise his hands for takbir tahdima and the way the woman would raise her hands for Takbir al-Tahlima. The Rasulullah is saying to Wa'i bin Hujar that when you raise your hands, then you raise your hands in line with your earlobes. However, when your women folk, when they raise their hands, then they should raise their hands in line with their chest, in line with their uh, breast, and then they should with their, and then start their namaz. Furthermore, there's another hadith of Musannaf ibn Rabbi Shayba where it's related by uh, Abdul Rabi bin Zaytun anhu that he says that I saw Umm Darda anha reading Salah Tarfa'u kaffayha hazwa man kabayha hina tastatihu salah that I saw her raising her hands in line with her shoulders hazwa man kabayha when she begins her Salah so again a clear hadith illustrating the distinction that when a woman when she reads the namaz she should raise her hands to her shoulders to her chest and then she should uh, begin her namaz not like the way a man does, and that is that he raises his hand in line with his earlobes. So that is the first hadith, and then another couple of hadiths I'll just mention when it comes to sajda, that when a woman, when she does the sajda, then obviously as I mentioned that she should be more concealed, and it's mentioned a hadith of Sunan al-Bayhaqi, and also of Qanzul Ummal, where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that when a woman, when she prostrates, when she goes into sajda, then she should press her stomach to her side that her stomach should be pressed uh, against with uh, uh, should be pressed with her thighs which is more concealing for her that her limbs and everything should be pressed with her body her stomach should be on the floor her buttocks should be on the floor and in a concealed way she should do such that that is the hadith of Kanzul Ummal and also other hadith as well of Jamil Musanif where the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that when a woman when she sits for tashahud then she should do istifaz and what does istifaz mean? basically she should place her right and her left leg 
to her right side, like the way I'm sitting like this, and then she should sit on her buttocks, and she should sit in tashakhud in that way, which is more concealing for her. So these are a few hadiths, there's other hadiths, and you know, many scholars have actually written separate books on that, so that's why I'm not going too deep into this particular topic, because you can find these books in many uh, stores like Amsterdam and so on, where he actually describes how the, uh, the distinction between the man's salah and the women's salah. So the conclusion which I would like to uh, mention from this particular topic is that the same way there is a distinction in the ruling between men and women, similarly there is also a distinction between the way a man reads his namaz and the way the woman reads her namaz. Before I finish just one final masla here, I know many like sisters probably were listening on the scanner and they may be thinking to themselves like, you know, I'm around 20, 25, 30 years old and the whole life I've been reading the mass exactly the same way as a man been reading my namaz. So they may be thinking to themselves that would my namaz for the past 10, 15 years is accepted or not. So the masla is that your namaz would be accepted. If you had been reading the mass similar to the way a man has been reading the mass, i.e. doing ruku exactly the same way as a man or doing sajda exactly the same way as a man, then your namaz would be accepted. However, what I would advise is that find a book particularly get a book such as Talim al Haq where it actually shows pictures how a woman should read her namaz, you know, those positions, those postures where it differs from the way a man reads his namaz and then, you know, study those books and then as soon as you learn the way you to read the namaz, to read the procedure of the namaz and obviously implement it uh, as soon as possible. But the subsequent or the last 10, 15 years you've been reading namaz in a different way, your namaz would be accepted. And the reason why it's accepted is because the way the women read the namaz is actually sunnah. Okay, it's not one of the essentials or it's not one of the prerequisites of namaz. Obviously, the essentials of namaz is like you do kira'a, you do ruku, you stand, you do sajda and so on. So if a woman, say for example, been doing her ruku, but she's been doing it like a man does, her, does his ruku, then the namaz would be valid, the namaz would be accepted or it would be considered as that the woman has left out something which is sunnah, something which has been a practice of the wives of Rasulullah the female sahabas and obviously of the female predecessors and the tabetabin and their predecessors as well. Now before uh, we finish, there's just a couple of questions which uh, brothers have posed over the past week. The first question is with regards to can women do ithikaf at home? Now obviously women they can do itikaf in the masjid and there's hadiths with regards to that. And similarly, women can also do itikaf at home. There's nothing wrong with it. But the question which the brother posed was, are there any clear hadiths which says that women can do itikaf at home? Okay, obviously if you look in all the books of fiqh and so on, it does say that women they can do itikaf at home. But obviously within this, we live in a society where people want to, they don't rely on books of fiqh, they want to know that you know, what is, what is it saying in the hadith? So the hadith is, if you, those if you want, anyone wants to write it down, the hadith which can be found in Musannaf Abdul Raza on page 350, volume 4. And it's related by Ibn Abi Mulaika that اِعْتَقَفَتِ الْعَيْشَةُ بَيْنَ حِرَى وَالثُبَيْ That Sayyidah Aisha the Anha, the blessed wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she did itikaf between the mountains of Hira and between the mountains of Tibet. That between Hira, like Gari Hira, everybody knows where Hira is in Makkah. Between Hira and Tibet, she did itikaf there. فَقُلْنَا نَعْتِيكِ هُنَا And I said to her that I will come and see you, I will come and uh, meet you there. وَعَبْدٌ لَهَا يَأُمُّهَا And she had a slave, I say the Aisha the Anha had a slave, who would do the imamat of Hazrat Aisha Radhanha, meaning that Sayyid Aisha Radhanha had a slave and the slave would go to that place between the mountains of Hira and Subed and he would lead Sayyid Aisha Radhanha in the prayer. Wa Abdun Laha Ya Ummuha. So this is a clear hadith of Musannaf Abdul Razak saying that women they can do itikaf in another place besides their masjid. So obviously this hadith is indicating that women can do uh, itikaf in the masjid. However, people want to know that can they do itikaf in their own home. So we get this hadith from the Aisha Danha. She did itikaf at a place between the mountains of Hira and between the mountains of Tibet. Clearly, 
indicating that it is permissible for women to do itikaf in their own homes. Obviously, this is a masla which all the scholars agree upon, but this is a clear hadith saying that it is permissible for women to do itikaf in their own homes. So that is the first masla. And the second masla, uh, very quickly, was with regards to mortgage and zakat. Now, so I'm not going to go into detail now, like whether mortgage is permissible or not. But uh, obviously, zakat, uh, many people during the month of Ramadan, they give zakat. So they're asking that if I have a mortgage, then how, how do I uh, calculate my zakat? Because as all of you know that if you are in debt, then that amount of debt is subtracted from your zakatable assets for that year. So just say for example, if you like have 100,000 pounds savings in your account and you owe someone 10,000 pounds, so you don't give zakat on 100,000 pounds, you will give zakat on 90,000 pounds. Okay, now the question is with regards to mortgage. Now mortgage, that is also a debt as well. Okay, you owe the company, you owe the bank, bank you know, X amount of money. So just say for example, like, you know, you, you got savings of £100,000 and you bought a house and the mortgage is around £150,000. Then what would happen is that, strictly speaking, according to the rules, because the mortgage is a debt, that person would not be liable to give any zakat. That he would not have to give zakat for that year because... He's got £100,000 savings, but his mortgage is £150,000. So his debt outweighs the, uh, is more than the uh, assets which he has. So strictly speaking, the, he would not have to give zakat. So the scholars, what they have said is that the masla here is that the annual installments which you give for the mortgage or you give to the mortgage company, that will be subtracted from your zakatable assets for that year. So just say for example, you've got 150,000 pound mortgage, but you're going to give it over 25 years. But every year you'll be giving around, just say, 5,000 pounds. So what will happen is that, you know that 5,000 pounds, that annual installment, that will only be extracted from your zakatable assets for that year. So just say for example, you've got 100,000 pounds uh, savings, and you're going to be giving 5,000 uh, pounds to the mortgage company for this particular year. So what will happen is that only 5,000 pounds will be extracted from the uh, zakatable assets and whatever is left over, i.e. 95,000 pounds, you will give zakat on 95,000 pounds. So that is the masla with regards to zakat and mortgage. That the mortgage, you don't subtract the whole amount from your zakatable assets. Basically, whatever installments you are going to give for that particular year, that will only be extracted from the zakatable assets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the Sufi tracks of Anwar Mr. Waqir, da'awana, hamdra, bil'alami. Any brothers, any questions?